Warm welcome to everyone who has come here to worship the newborn king. Today is the first Sunday after the epiphany of our Lord, a Sunday also known as the baptism of our Lord. For our service today, we'll use the service of all creation printed in the bulletin. Let's begin our worship by singing hymn number 89, To Jordan's River Came Our Lord. <laughs> In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Let us confess our sins before God and one another. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, mighty judge of all people, we admit and confess our sinfulness. We have not lived up to our calling as your faithful people. So often we have done the evil you forbid, and too many times have not done the good you demand. We do repent and are truly sorry for our sins in thought, word, and deed. Have mercy on us, merciful Father, for the sake of Jesus Christ, your Son, Forgive us all wrongs that need your grace, and with the power of the Holy Spirit, direct us to serve you faithfully all our days, through Jesus Christ our Lord. God of 
of all creation, earth and sea and sky, God of all eternity, hear us, hear us. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. God of every nation, God of all who live, God of meek and lowly ones, hear us. Hear us, Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. God of our salvation, God of grace and peace, God wisdom and of love, hear us, hear us. This is our heartfelt confession, then there is good news for us. The Heavenly Father sent us, His Son Jesus, to atone for our sins. In Him, God's kingdom has already come among us. This does not come to us because we confess it, but because God's grace, God's choice, God's intervention in Jesus saves us from our sins. Do you believe this? I do so believe. Because of Christ's redemptive work, we are a redeemed and forgiven people. Therefore, as a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. This very forgiveness is God's good news for us today, for tomorrow, for forever. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord, God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sin of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father. Receive our prayer. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord. You alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen, amen. Glory.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father in heaven, at the baptism of Jesus in the river Jordan, you proclaimed him your beloved son and anointed him with the Holy Spirit. Keep us who are baptized into Christ, faithful in our calling as your children, and make us heirs with him of everlasting life. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. First scripture lesson for this, the baptism of our Lord, is the Old Testament lesson recorded in the book of 1 Samuel, chapter 16, beginning at verse 1. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. The Lord said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, Do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, the Lord has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shammah pass by, but Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, the Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, he is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him, we will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. Here ends the first scripture lesson. the God of all creation, God of mercy and compassion. Alleluia, alleluia, praise the word of truth and life. Tree of life and endless wisdom, be our root, our growth and glory. Alleluia, alleluia, praise the word of truth and life. Living water, we are thirsting for the life that you have promised. Alleluia, alleluia, praise the word of truth and life. Come, O oh Spirit, Kindle fire in the hearts of all your people. Alleluia, alleluia, praise the word of truth and life. Praise the God of all creation, God of mercy and compassion.
Please rise for the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the third chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. John answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his barn, but he will burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. The hymn of the day is hymn 710 in the Christian Worship Supplement Book. You may be seated. mercy and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The sermon text for today is the Old Testament lesson recorded in the book of 1 Samuel chapter 16. I'll read the last two verses of our text. So we sent for him and had him brought in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, rise and anoint him. He is the one. 
So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came powerfully upon David. And we pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, here's how things used to work a long, long time ago. During the school day, there was this thing called recess. Recess was intended as a time for kids to get exercise, not to check their texts or emails. So kids would usually go outside, no matter what the weather, and often games would be played, games like kickball or basketball. And in order to play these games, teams were needed. And so the two best players were chosen as captains and then everyone else lined up to be picked for a team. Now if you subjected yourself to this lineup, you knew that you were at the mercy of those captains and their selection. And you stood there and you prayed, please, don't let me be the last one chosen. In a certain sense, the last one wasn't even chosen. The last one was assigned by default to a team that didn't want him or her. I wonder if this still goes on today. I'll, I'll bet it doesn't. I mean, we've done away with winning and losing. Surely we've done away with this practice as well because after all, we don't want that person who's chosen last to feel bad. But I think somebody forgot to give God the memo. God acts, I suppose, in a very politically incorrect way in our text because what do we find God doing? He's, he's picking. He's choosing. God picked or chose the first king of Israel. His name was Saul. And God regretted that choice. Not because it was a bad choice, but because Saul went bad. He went the way of most earthly rulers. He was filled with pride and arrogance and eventually turned away from God. And the person that this greatly affected was Samuel, his pastor. Samuel was grieved about this. God asked him, how long are you going to mourn for Saul? To get him out of his funk, God gave Samuel a job. Go anoint a replacement. And that's what we find Samuel doing in our Old Testament lesson for today. Today, let's see something very simple from our te text. Let's see the last becomes God's first choice. How did the last become God's first choice? Well, you heard about it in our Old Testament lesson. God sent his faithful prophet to Bethlehem to anoint a king from the family of Jesse. And when Samuel arrived in Bethlehem, the elders of the town were panicked. Usually when one of God's prophets showed up, he came to admonish, to pronounce judgment. Have you come in shalom, they asked. Samuel said, I've come in shalom. I've come in peace. Samuel invited Jesse and his sons to uh, sacrifice. And we hear in our lesson that Samuel was greatly impressed by the appearance of those three oldest sons. Wow, they looked big and handsome and strapping. And Samuel thought any one of these guys would make a great king. But of course, Samuel was only looking on the outside. The Lord looks at the heart. And so after plowing through all seven of Jesse's sons and not finding a king among them, Samuel asked Jesse, don't you have any more kids? Jesse's like, well, I got one. He doesn't even call him David. He calls him the youngest. 
the baby of the family. He's out watching the sheep. Samuel said, go get him. And when David was brought in, the Lord said, he's the one. And so Samuel uncorked his horn of oil and poured it on his head, thus anointing him as the second king of Israel. The word in our text is really the word for Messiah, to anoint. The Messiah is the anointed one. And this anointing was God's way of saying, I have chosen this person for a very special job. So what really happened in our text? The last, David, became God's first choice. The same thing happened a thousand years later with one of David's descendants. What has happened to Jesus since his birth? We haven't heard much about him. We only hear one instance from his adolescent years when he was age 12. Otherwise, he lives in obscurity in the city of Nazareth. He's called the carpenter's son, and he's also called a carpenter. He lives in that Nazareth place. Can anything good come from Nazareth, you know, that place filled with redneck Nazarenes? There he lives building things, furniture, houses. Can you see him living there for 30 years in obscurity? working hard each and every day, having calloused hands, hands that are probably filled with splinters. But then suddenly he bursts on the scene. He arrives at the place where John the Baptist is baptizing and requests baptism for himself. And John is reluctant. And the main reason is because he feels unworthy to do this. And yet Jesus prevails upon John and Jesus is baptized. He is christened. He is anointed, not with oil, but with water. And the signs that accompany that christening are amazing. The bodily appearance of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove and the voice from heaven that boomed out God's approval of his son. At the water, waters of the Jordan, Jesus was anointed, Peter writes in Acts 10, with the Holy Spirit and with power. And in a certain sense, in the same way as it took place with David, this was God's way of saying, here is my chosen one. He is the one that I have chosen for a special purpose. And in a certain sense, Jesus was anointed to be king on the day of his baptism. Okay, it's time for picking. Let's get lined up here, okay? How would we arrange ourselves? Well, some of you are the oldest in the family. Some of you are only children. Some of you are the babies of the family. David was the baby of the family. Jesus was the oldest in his family. Well, maybe we could rearrange ourselves on the basis of education. Some of you have high school diplomas, GED. Some of you are college graduates. Some of you have postgraduate degrees. And what was true about David, probably not much education out there watching the sheep. And as far as Jesus goes, well, he was literate. He could read, right? But we don't hear him attending any college or anything like that. Certainly no rabbinical school. Oh, maybe we could arrange ourselves on the basis of appearance, you know. I mean, when it comes to my family, I am one of five brothers, and I always claim I am certainly the most handsome out of all of those five. All right, are you ready to get lined up so that God can pick? Where would you fall? First in line? Middle? Certainly not last, right? You got your list of people, you know, those are the, <laughs> certainly I would come before them. <laughs> you, you know what they've done, you know what they have been like, but don't be fooled. God isn't fooled. God doesn't look at outward appearance, at outward things that fool everyone else in our lives. Where does God look? God looks at the heart, and what does he see when he looks there? Well, Jesus says, what God sees. 
in Mark chapter 7. For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that evil thoughts come. Sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly, and people of God, all of that and more, much, much more, put us dead last, right? And don't fool yourself into thinking, well, if he's not going to choose me, I'm going to choose him. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to choose him. Jesus blows that one out of the water in John 15. You did not choose me. But then he graciously goes on, but I chose you. And how did God choose you? He chose you. He anointed you to be his own in the water of your baptism. In the water of your baptism, it's as if God reached down from heaven and said, you are mine. I have chosen you to be my own. I put my name on you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and you belong to me. Imagine that. It happens each and every time a person is baptized. The last becomes God's first choice. And that is what is true about each and every one of you. Well, we've seen today how the last became God's first choice. Now let's see why. Why did David, the last one in his family, become God's first choice? Well, he became God's first choice so that he could be king. Do you remember what the job of an ancient king was? The primary job of an ancient king was to fight, to go out and fight for his people. And of course, David did this. I mean, he led his armies into battle. He didn't sit in a bunker and direct the soldiers to go fight. He led them into battle. No wonder the people loved him, because they knew every time there was a battle, David was out there risking his life for his people. No wonder his mighty men rallied around him and would do anything for him, risk their lives for him. At a moment's notice, they loved him. Finally, ultimately, as David got older, his men had to tell him, you can't do this anymore. You're just getting too old. You're going to get killed in battle. Come on. You're worth more than 10,000 of us. Okay. David finally acquiesced to their demands. But all of this fighting on the part of David, of course, began with a very special incident that's recorded for us in the book of Samuel. It was while David was still watching the sheep, living in Bethlehem. His older brothers had joined Saul's army to go and fight against the Philistines. And Jesse said to David, David, go take some care packages to your brothers and find out what's going on at this battle. So David said, fine, I'll go and I'll check this out. And when he got there, he found the army of Israel and the army of the Philistines lined up against each other. And he also discovered that for 40 days, twice a day, a giant named Goliath came out and taunted the army of Israel. He also discovered that not one person was willing to fight Goliath. Not even King Saul was willing to go out and fight for his people. The worst part of this whole thing, of course, was that when Goliath came out and taunted Israel, he blasphemed the God of Israel. He cursed the God of Israel. And when David heard this, he was not going to stand for it. And so he went out and he fought for God's people. But before he picked up his slingshot and stone, David fought in a way that you and I might think is quite unexpected. Little anointed David fought with words. This is what David said to the giant Goliath. All those gathered here will know that it is not by sword or spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you all into our hands. You see, little David was anointed by God to be king, and the job of a king...
king was to fight. And the first way that David fought was with words. Now let's jump ahead a thousand years. When Jesus was anointed, he of course was anointed into his threefold office of prophet, priest, and king. And so let's focus on that office of king today. What again was the job of a king? The job of a king was to fight on behalf of his people. And as with David, Jesus' battle involved not a slingshot, but words. Again, after a 40-day period of time, after Jesus' baptism, after 40 days, what happened? He was met by a giant, not Goliath, but Satan. And Satan came to destroy and kill, right, with three temptations. Jesus realized that his battle was not against flesh and blood. He did not bear a sword. He did not have an army. Later on, he would only have disciples. And yet he fought for his people. He fought for you and for me. He came as the second Adam. Not to lose the way the first Adam did, but to win. And so not with one blow, but with three. Each time making use of the sword of the Spirit. It is written, Jesus said, three times. He defeated those temptations in the wilderness. And Luke tells us that the devil had to depart from Jesus, but looked for an opportune time when he could tempt him again. And so the battle went on, right? And Jesus cast out demons during his earthly ministry. Jesus fought a battle for the truth with words until finally... That battle came to an end when Jesus crushed the head of the serpent by laying down his life. The innocent died for the guilty that you and I might have deliverance from sin and death and the devil. Peter in Acts chapter 10 again put it this way. God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and Jesus went around doing good and healing all those who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. That healing is ours. That victory that Jesus won is ours through faith in him. All right, so God was with him. God is also with you, his anointed people. What is that term that we like to bear or that word we use to refer to ourselves with? Isn't it that word Christian? What does the word Christian mean? In a certain sense, of course, it means a follower of Christ. But what does Christ mean? Christ means the anointed one. Today, I want you to think of yourselves, baptized children of God, as Christians, those who are anointed by God, chosen by God. And again, what is the anointing all about? It's God's way of choosing someone for a special purpose. Okay, what's your purpose? Well, let's think about what David's special purpose was, to be king, right? Jesus' purpose, King, Messiah. What's your purpose? Well, you and I are part of a royal priesthood. More than that, you and I are part of a church that is called militant. And I would say to you today that you have been anointed by God for a special purpose, and that is to fight the good fight of faith. How do you feel when I say that, that your purpose in life is to fight? You might say, whoa, hold it, Pastor. I'm not a fighter. I'm a lover. Come on. Didn't Jesus say something about blessed are the peacemakers? Didn't he say in the Psalms something about the fact that it's good and pleasing to God when brothers live together and work together in harmony and love? And I say to that, yes, all of that is true. But it is also true that it, there is a time for peace and there is a time for war. And people of God, I am afraid that we crave peace so much 
that we have become unwilling to fight, not fight with fists, not fight with weapons, but fight in the realm of ideas. Fight for the truth. Fight for the spiritual welfare of our children. Fight for our own spiritual welfare. Because let me tell you, Goliath is here. And he is proclaiming blasphemy against the God of the Bible. And the latest form of blasphemy is very simple, and it goes like this. We all worship the same God. Oh man, that sounds so appealing, you know? I mean, with one sentence like that, you just completely do away with all need for mission work, all need to study the Bible, every effort needed to try to hold on to the truth of Scripture. It's just all swept away. And we hear that as those anointed by God and oh, whatever. We're kind of like the army of Israel, just standing there for 40 days as Goliath shouts out his blasphemies against our holy God. People of God, I think maybe the time has come for us to realize we need to fight. We need to fight for the truth. We need to use words to express spiritual truths. We need to speak the truth in love. And yesterday, I verbally proclaimed, wow, at the, at the lunch table after reading an article from the opinion page of the Daily Herald. There, a lady named Paula Curlin from Carol Stream proclaimed the truth. She was writing about a professor at Wheaton College who was espousing this, oh, we all worship the same God, even quoting Pope Francis in her effort. And this lady just simply wrote, love came down at Christmas and brought redemption for all. She quoted Romans chapter 5, verse 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I need to fight and contend for the truth, not in hatred, but in love, in love for souls, in, in love for those who are lost, with a desire that all come to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, have faith in him, and be saved. The last become God's first choice. You know what? That's not exactly the way that works on the playground, is it? The last are always last. I can never recall from my childhood that last person being told, don't worry, next time you'll be first. <laughs> it just doesn't happen. That's the way it works with God, isn't it? I mean, didn't Jesus often say the first will be last and the last will be first? He said that again and again and again. Because that's the way it works with God, right? That's the way it worked with David. He was last in his family. He wasn't even invited to the sacrifice. That's the way it worked with Jesus. Oh, who in the world would ever imagine someone from Nazareth being the Messiah? And that is the way it has worked with you and me as well. Last because of our sin, and yet God has chosen us to be his holy people. He has anointed you and made you an heir of heaven. God has given you a purpose. Contend for the faith. May God bless you as you do that. Amen. Please rise. The peace of God that goes beyond all understanding will guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Our Lord, amen. On a Sunday known as the baptism of our Lord, we use Luther's uh, section on the sacrament of holy baptism as our confession of faith. The institution of baptism, first, what is baptism? Baptism is not plain in water, but it is water used by God's command and connected with God's word, which is that word of God Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Matthew, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The blessings of baptism. Second, what does baptism do for us? Baptism works forgiveness of sins, delivers from death and the devil, 
and gives eternal salvation to all who believe this as the words and promise of God declare. What are these words and promises of God? Christ our Lord says in the last chapter of Mark, whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. The power of baptism, third, how can water do such great things? It is certainly not the water that does such things, but God's word which is in and with the water, and faith which trusts this word used with the water. For without God's word, the water is just plain water and not baptism. But with this word, it is baptism. It is a gracious water of life and a washing of rebirth by the Holy Spirit. Where is this written? St. Paul says in Titus chapter 3, God saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit whom he poured out on us generously through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs, having the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy saying. The meaning of baptism for our daily life. Fourth, what does baptizing with water mean? Baptism means that the old Adam in us should be drowned by daily contrition and repentance, and that all its evil deeds and desires be put to death. It also means that a new person should daily arise to live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Where is this written? St. Paul says in Romans chapter 6, we were buried with Christ through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. We worship God with our offerings. Please rise for prayer. Gracious Father, at the Jordan River you called Jesus your beloved Son, in whom you are well pleased, and anointed him with the Holy Spirit and power. 
Assure us that because we in baptism have put on Christ, you also call us your beloved and are well pleased with us. Renew us as your baptized children so that we walk in newness of life, considering ourselves dead to sin and alive to you in Christ Jesus. Father, you opened the heavens and the Holy Spirit descended on your only begotten Son. As we hear your good news and receive Christ's body and blood, send the same Holy Spirit to us, whom you have made your children. Enable us to remain steadfast in the faith and fight for and defend the faith. Gracious Father, look in mercy on all those who govern our country and the nations around the world. Give them courage to defend what is right and correct what is wrong. Grant them hearts that care for those who are vulnerable, including the unborn. Defend those who serve in the armed forces and all who labor and keep us safe. Allow commerce and the arts to flourish in ways that benefit all people. Father, at Jesus' baptism, your son voluntarily took on himself all our frailties and the results of our sinfulness. Give your comfort to all who mourn. Extend your healing hand to all who need your care. Assure them of your promise that even when your people walk through the fire of trials, the flames will not consume them. Grant them faith to believe that they need not fear, for you are with them. Gracious Father, receive our thanks for the lives of all your servants who were washed in baptism, taught your word, fed with Christ's precious body and blood, and now rest in your presence. Strengthen the baptismal faith of all whom you feed today at Christ's table. Prepare us for the day when we who have been united with him in death like his are united with him in a resurrection like his as well. Into your hands, gracious Father, we commend ourselves and all those for whom we pray. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, in whose name we join in praying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good, right, and proper that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, who through holy baptism has granted us new lives in Christ Jesus. Mercifully grant that we may live in baptismal grace all of our lives and await with joy the eternity that is to come in your glorious presence. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying. Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
sing during the distribution is hymn 709 in the supplement book. All things are now ready, let us come. Christ given into death for all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This same body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Christ given into death for all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood. Christ shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. May this same body and blood strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Savior, 
Christ, given into death for all of your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood. strengthen you and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. true body of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for all of your sins. unto the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. O Lord God, Heavenly Father, ruler of all things, we receive this foretaste of the feast to come through this blessed meal. Send your Holy Spirit that having now received this holy sacrament, we may die daily through baptism and rise restored and new 
and joyfully continue our earthly pilgrimage until that time when we are gathered into your heavenly kingdom to share in your blessings for all eternity. This we ask through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Our closing hymn is printed in the bulletin. Welcome to the visitors who've joined us for worship today. There are a few announcements. In about 15 minutes, we'll start with our education program of Sunday school, starting in the fellowship hall and then adult Bible class in the cafe. Tonight, confirmation class resumes at 5.30. There is a makeup class that'll start at 4.30. 4.30 for the makeup class. And then 5.30 to 7 is the normal class. Monday, the ladies group is going to meet. And then on Wednesday, uh, in town, there's the preschool fair. And so uh, work is beginning to try to gather the student body for the 2016-2017 school year and in the days ahead you're going to hear a lot about this uh, on February 3rd we're going to have an open house here uh, for our preschool and at the same time the work of getting ready for a, an accreditation visit which will take place in April that work continues so uh, a lot of effort is being put into trying to uh, make our preschool a better preschool and to have more children from the community attend that preschool on Thursday, the green team is going to meet from 6.30 to 8, and the tone chime choir is scheduled to meet at 7.30 as well. And on Friday, uh, the men's Bible class uh, will meet. On the last Sunday of the month, which is the bye week before the Super Bowl, we always have a bowling outing at the Brunswick Zone, and that is at a very reasonable price of $5 for two hours of bowling. So uh, please uh, plan to uh, attend that bowling outing, and to my understanding, um, 
prizes will be awarded as well. And then uh, Lent starts early this year because Easter is early. So Lent begins on February 10th, and there'll be a rotation of pastors for our midweek Lenten service on Wednesday evenings, which will be at 7. And then also soon, if not today, uh, a sign-up sheet has been posted to sign up for meals as well. There is something to eat and drink after the service today. You're all invited to stay for that. Uh, those are the announcements.